seems to be recording. Um, sometimes it cuts out because if there's activity on Facebook and my notifications are on, it interrupts me. I have tried to film this already. Um, so the ghost is not solely a result of the neon lighting, but um, it does seem to exacerbate it. So I wanted to talk about um, the meditation painting that I was telling you about in the previous video a little bit when I was talking about mukta meditation. I had started to do that kind of painting uh, one of my my original art teacher actually started to offer a class <clears throat> doing this um, type of painting based on a book called Life, Paint and Passion by Michelle Cassel and Stuart Cubley. And um, she had originally taught me my friend um, had originally taught me kind of a technical stuff. I never really took art classes because I haven't really gone, to, I have not had a formal education. So um, I had, uh, she taught me like, you know, shading and a little bit of perspective, you know, about the vanishing point and the how the horizon always rises to meet your, your line of sight. It's always at eye level, unless you go up in space. Um, you know, a few things like that. And, uh, but it was interesting. I had gotten to a point in my life where I was kind of blocked. And um, so she invited me to join this class. Now, the premise of this approach to painting is to paint completely uninhibited like a child. Now, when people think of a child painting, they tend to stereotype it as if, um, oh, you just paint something silly, which you might do. But the point is to be as free as a child would be, um, but as you are now. So you kind of, Initially, when I started the class, I did a lot of stuff that was kind of a, an attempt to break my habits. So I would paint stuff that I didn't necessarily normally like um, to look at. Because the idea is to get past your expectation of what you want to produce and actually completely let go of that while you're painting. And um, this kind of uh, intersected with my meditation practice because the whole point of meditation as I had learned it was to get to the formless and I had actually in my tradition found myself struggling because I thought that the formless was had to be the negation of form like you had to reach something that had no form instead of realizing that formless means not any specific form, but it can include form. Um, because the whole universe, according to a Dwight philosophy, came out of formlessness, um, or is formless at its root, even as it appears to be an individual form. So because I could never experience that with my senses, I didn't really know how to understand that principle. And it was when I started doing this painting that I realized that I was constantly searching for something formless through form. And then I kind of got how everything is, I don't know how to describe it exactly. The thing that I was searching for was basically, well, when I was painting, which I didn't expect to be searching for, was exactly the same thing that I was searching for in meditation, which was the basis of everything. And in the philosophy, we call it consciousness, we call it space, we call it, you know, you could call it God or you could call it existence. Um, but 
it was very apparent when I was engaged with that or aware of that when I was painting because um, I would let go of expectation. I would be painting completely freely. It was very Tao. It was very much with the flow. And, um, and I could see the intersectionality of a whole bunch of religions and philosophies in that approach to painting. Now, there's a side effect that comes about when you paint this way, which is that you paint stuff that you never thought you could paint. I have painted some stuff that was technically way beyond my skill, kind of when I wasn't thinking about it, which is both a lovely thing to happen, but it also, then you try and repeat it and um, you can get blocked when you're, because then again, you're trying to achieve something uh, which does not, is not conducive to the free kind of painting. And um, so there's all these principles. There's two books. One she wrote with Stuart Cubley. And in that there's some rules. Uh, one is that you never comment on another person's painting. And the other is that you never destroy. When you paint something that you don't like, you have to accept it and work with it. Um, like a flaw in your personality. It's very kind of therapeutic like that. Um, and then it's interesting if you feel angry at your painting or you feel like you hate what you did. The idea is to use that anger and then create something out of it instead of trying to paint over it. So, and it's interesting how quickly that dissolves your anger. It's amazing how a creative action born out of anger diffuses the anger. Like this is a really interesting philosophical principle for me to also think about how you could apply that in life when you're angry to come up with a creative solution that expresses that anger but does not destroy anything. Um, <clears throat> like, you know, I don't know. There's, this is part of the reason why I find like music like Tori Amos or Bjork is so fascinating because there's a lot of anger in the music but it's so beautiful that I always feel very uplifted by it. Um, and then something happened with Stuart Cubley and Michelle Casso. And she wrote a second book called Point Zero, which is more hardcore Zen approach to the painting, where you're, you're it's, and, th and this is more meditative, I would say. Supposedly, there was some kind of um, disagreement between Stuart Cubley and Michelle Casso, and she wrote on her website when she produced Point Zero that this book had nothing to do with Stuart Cubley. And um, it's a very clear statement. I gather that Stuart Cubley was using his, uh, what he had got out of their book that they had done together more as a method of success in business. I think this is what, this is kind of the rumor that I heard. Um, and for Michelle Casso, the whole point was to get to point zero. It was not about worldly success. It was about what happened inside you. So, um, so yes, so one of the rules is that you don't paint over anything. I'm all over the place. And the other is, is that if you're painting in a group, you do not comment, especially to criticize, but even to compliment someone else on what they're doing, even just to say casually, oh, that's nice. It's better if you don't really talk, um, except to ask for help from the instructor if it's someone who has done the whole course and knows how to keep guiding you back to freedom. Um, because the thing is, if, uh, if I say to someone, oh, that's lovely, what you're doing um, even if they think consciously that it's not affecting them subconsciously they're going to want to try to repeat the thing that got approval and uh, and it and then it leads back into um, it leads back into product trying to achieve something and then your ego gets involved so the whole idea is basically to paint without ego and it's incredibly hard because basically, you know, you're in a, it should be 
easy because you're just playing like you're not it's not like you're there to be an artist or to sell you know your work for millions or anything like that you, it, there's really no point except to do the experiment as if you're just i don't know scribbling doodling on a on a stick it note basically but with big paints and so the idea is the big paints kind of make you a little bit more challenged so it has more energy and more force and then you release it and um so i i don't know i have not done it for a while but i imbibed it and it kind of became a part of my process and then again i got really blocked because then there was this clash between two the part of me that wanted a product and the part of me that wanted to be completely free and um they were warring in my head and now it seems like they have achieved some sort of harmony where I lead with the freedom and then I if if I want to use a technical thing on a whim I'll use it but um, I, I seem to have gotten around that but if you think about it it's quite amazing if you imagine that you could live your whole life that way um, I mean not like just running around crazy but I realize like there's a complete difference between being free and being a rebel for the sake of being a rebel like if you're really, because this is this was a question that came up a lot in our philosophy, is that if the whole world is an illusion, then you can just do anything. You can murder people. You can rape. It doesn't, it, you know, there's no consequence. But the truth is, is if you really know that you're free, then you don't need to do any of those things because you're so sure of your freedom that there's really no necessity for you to prove it by killing someone. Theoretically, you could kill someone. But there's no necessity for you to, I mean, why would you? You know, that, that you wouldn't necessarily be drawn to do that. And um, I don't know, it's kind of interesting because I realized that even as you're completely free, you're following the path of freedom. So you're kind of being guided at the same time. Anyway, um, so I will link this book down below and um, it's a really good book it is even more beneficial actually no I would say it's equally as beneficial to people who have never painted and think that they cannot paint as it would be to someone who has been painting for a long time and is very reliant on their technical skill um, so I mean Sometimes, like, there was times in the class when um, I would get blocked and then the teacher would ask me, my friend who's my art teacher for years, would say, um, what if you had to paint something right now? Or, you know, the, she would try different things. Like, uh, sometimes it, it's like this mindful thing that you do with your body, like uh, you, you're, you're observing how your body even will manufacture cramps to stop you from painting something that actually you want to paint but you're ashamed or something like it all this weird stuff and um and sometimes you know i mean my teacher was very intuitive so she could kind of gauge what was blocking you and then she'd say okay look at the colors pick the first color that grabs your attention it doesn't matter and and then you would just go with it and trust it and it would work and you'd feel like this incredible release and then but you could go over into being too lackadaisical where you're just like you were almost carelessly free and the point is actually to be caring at the same time but not not crippled by the weight of the responsibility of what you're doing because you're playing but like a child who's playing still makes a sandcastle they don't just um I mean, they might make a mound also, but it's they're not they're not just kind of being really random. They're um, they're not just vomiting. They're actually there's always like when it you know you see children in preschool or whatever, they're always kind of trying to create something or trying to do something. Interest that's sort of interesting and fun for them, and I, I I kind of think like there's a huge value to getting back to that state of mind for for adults and for human beings in general because we spend a lot of time trying to adapt to what we think is 
required of us from society. And, um, and quite often the creative solutions are, are much more beneficial to society than the ones that are just reinforcing the old structures. So um, anyway, that is all I have to say about Life, Paint, and Passion for now. And I would definitely recommend that you read it. And I would say read Life, Paint, and Passion before you read Point Zero, because Point Zero is the deep end. So um, now you're all going to go and read Point Zero, I know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Love and light, and uh, thank you for watching. <laughs>